then you can start. Namaskar, Jai Hind, good morning to all. A very warm welcome to the sixth edition of the Pune Dialogue on National Security, commonly referred to as PDNS. This year's dialogue is PDNS 2021. It is, as most of us know, is the annual flagship program of Pune International Center. Again, Pune International Center is quite often referred to as PIC. The PIC is an independent public policy think tank which ideates and deliberates on issues of national importance and contributes to policy making in our country. PIC hosts major national and international events each year. Among them are, let me mention a few, National Conference on Social Innovation, Asia Economic Dialogue in association with the Ministry of External Affairs, and of course, the Pune Dialogue on National Security, just to name a few. PDNS 2021 is organized by the PIC, jointly with the New Delhi-based Policy Perspectives Foundation, PPF for short, the Tribune Trust, which is based in Chandigarh, and the Center for Advanced Strategic Studies, CAS for short, which is based in Pune. The theme for this year's PDNS, or PDNS 2021, is National Security Preparedness in the Age of disasters and pandemics. Before going further, let me introduce quickly myself. My name is General Patankar, and I'm the convener of PDNS 2021. It'll be my pleasure to navigate the whole event through its course over the next two days. Part of that would involve commencing and closing sessions introducing chairpersons and speakers where, wherever it's appropriate for me. And in case there are any administrative announcements to make those I also. Let me come back to the theme of PDNS 2021, which is, as I said earlier, national security preparedness in the age of disasters and pandemics. Apart from the opening session, which is the inaugural session in which we are currently, and the closing session, which will be the valedictory session, there will be four other major sessions. There'll be two of those today and two of them tomorrow, as it is given out in the flow of program. The four sessions would be, the first one amongst them, is a presentation by PPF. And the theme of the sub theme of that is disaster risk reduction as part of national security preparedness. External dimension and future threats constitutes the sub theme of the second session. In the third session, we'll be looking at dealing with future challenges and the role of science and technology. And the fourth one, which again is tomorrow evening, which more or less wraps up the discussions and deliberations, is devoted to imperatives, imperatives for national security. So that is more or less the, the structure of PDNS 2021. And we are now embarking upon the inaugural session of PDNS. This session will commence with a welcome address by our president, Dr. Masherkar. And as most of you know, he is a scientist extraordinaire and a world renowned scientist at that. He is actually better known as a national research professor 
He was the former director general of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. Uh, many of us know, know that organization as CSIR, president of the Indian National Science Academy, chairman of National Innovation Foundation, and president of Global Research Alliance. His more than 60 honors, I'll say that again, 60, six zero honors, include the prestigious Lenovo Science Prize of the World Academy of Science, JRD Tata Corporate Leadership Award and Star of Asia Award. 44 universities have bestowed honorary directorate, uh, the honorary doctorates on him. He was a member of the Science Advisory Council of the Prime Minister for around 30 years. He is a recipient of Padma Shri, Padma Bhushan, and Padma Vibhushan. Dr. Mashilkar is president of Pune International Center. And I might add that he is a beacon for everybody in Pune International Center. May I request uh, Dr. Mashilkar to kindly give the opening address, the welcome address, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Patankar, for those very affectionate, very gracious uh, remarks. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to you all at PDNS uh, 2021. And uh, I extend this warm welcome on behalf of all the organizers, not only Pune International Center, but uh, Policy Perspective Foundation, uh, the Tribune Trust uh, Chandigarh, as also the Center for Advanced Studies uh, uh, Pune. As General Patankar explained, this is the sixth PDNS, and all our valued partners have worked steadfastly, worked very hard, and worked together for the past six years in making PDNS not just a flagship event of PIC, but also a very important national influencer, if I may say, on uh, uh, national thought, national action on issues of national security. So we are very proud to be together in this important endeavor. Uh, we are meeting at a very important juncture of, for PIC and also for the nation. For PIC, we just celebrated uh, uh, the completion of a decade long journey of PIC. And we can look back with great pride on what PIC has been uh, able to do as a thought leader. And uh, General Patankar very briefly, but very eloquently introduced what uh, PIC does, so I'm not going to elaborate. And for a nation, as India just crossed uh, 1 billion uh, vaccination milestone, which is a very significant uh, uh, benchmark. As again, uh, General Patanka explained, each year we choose a theme uh, for PDNS that is critical and relevant for the time. Uh, as uh, uh, we saw, uh, it is on uh, the theme was on internal and external dimension of national security, impact of new technologies, cybersecurity in particular, role of fourth and fifth state uh, on national security, uh, challenges of uh, governance on national security. So themes have been different. But in a light-hearted way, may I say that this year, uh, we did not have to choose the theme. The theme chose itself. And that was obvious because the theme is national security preparedness in the age of disasters and pandemics. Mind you the word, they have been very carefully chosen. The word is in the age of. In the age of means something that we have to be always prepared for and uh, sort of uh, live with. Uh, you know, WHO can't still define when the current coronavirus pandemic will end. No one can define it. No one can also celebrate. Sometimes the celebration can be premature. Like Israel celebrated full national vaccination, and then they went into a full national lockdown, thanks to the new virus. So therefore, that preparedness that we talk about, and the, the, the word uh, in the age of, these are uh, extraordinarily important. We have to be all the time prepared. Yeah, we have celebrated uh, 100 billion vaccinations, 
but real celebration will come when the entire nation gets vaccinated. But even then, we'll have to be prepared. So that's the point uh, that I want to emphasize. I think uh, both uh, our, our emphasis is on both disasters as well as pandemics. I'll take pandemics first. For example, a few things stand out about this pandemic uh, to my mind. The first was speed. The second was scale. And third are the lessons, both bad and good. Let's look at the speed. You know, in 1331, it took 16 years, 16 years for bubonic plague to spread its black death from Wuhan, China to Italy. And the same actors were acting again, Wuhan as well as Italy in 2020 it took 16 weeks, not 16 years for uh, COVID-19 to move from Wuhan to Italy. Just see the difference. It's such an interconnected uh, word today. So that is the speed. The scale, you know, 5 million lives have been lost uh, uh, and that's an understatement. Many people say the actual number is much more. Uh, livelihoods, I mean, look at India itself, 250 million in India moved uh, from poverty to extreme poverty, we are told by uh, expert. Uh, look at uh, the fact that 1.6 billion children were out of school within 100 days and one third of them were digitally deprived, so they couldn't study. Our rural villages, for example, for uh, last two years, uh, the children have not studied. Now, what impact it is going to have? So both the speed and scale, uh, and what are the lessons? And I would especially mention that uh, when we look at COP26 and uh, the meeting of the leaders in Glasgow, I think there are some important lessons that have to be remembered. The current pandemics, uh, a uh, pandemic actually provides a trailer for what will happen if a full-fledged climate crisis will uh, entail. Huge disruptions on demand side, huge disruptions on supply side, huge speeds of global transmission as we saw, uh, global amplification. In fact, there is a similarity between pandemics and uh, climate change because both are physical, both are systemic, uh, knockout effects propagate very fast, they are both non-stationary, there are risk multipliers, for example, the understated uh, vulnerabilities, uh, uh, vulnerabilities of the uh, healthcare system, they got exposed all around the world. Vulnerable population gets uh, most uh, exposed as we have seen before. The main point I want to make is that when we talk about climate change and uh, particularly disasters, we have to realize that uh, uh, the disaster frequency is going to increase rather than decrease because of climate change. So more unseasonal rains, floods, uh, landslides, uh, cyclones, I mean, whole range of things, and there are going to be more, and therefore we have to prepare uh, uh, more. So issue of disaster prevention, and as I said, we are talking about uh, both disaster uh, 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 prevention and mitigation, that has to become uh, an integral part of national security uh, policies. Uh, one cannot uh, uh, sort of uh, owe it. Uh, I uh, uh, would uh, simply say that uh, these are going to be terrific deliberations. I want to congratulate uh, General Patankar. He described himself uh, uh, as a navigator, uh, but I must say he has been the mastermind behind the entire program, the way he put in um, fantastic efforts uh, to get some of the best minds together and to present thoughts on how India should better prepare itself is phenomenal. So my salutations, uh, uh, General Patankar, for what uh, fantastic uh, uh, work you have done. Uh, we are really looking forward to our deliberations. We are very fortunate that eminent experts from National Disaster Management Authority uh, are going to speak to us and enlighten us in this uh, uh, conference. Uh, the discussions will focus upon disaster risk reduction, external dimensions, uh, further thesis, role of science and technology, all of them being very important. And finally, we are starting this uh, uh, inaugural session with Gabe Gusto. We are truly grateful to our esteemed National Security Advisor, Sri Ajit Dovalji, and also the Chief uh, Scientist of WHO, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, for giving their illuminating uh, views in this uh, inaugural session, uh, which will be so illuminating, so enlightening. 
uh, I'm quite sure. Uh, let me end my brief remarks uh, by recalling with joy uh, that uh, we are meeting on the eve of Festival of Lights. Just uh, two, three days left. Uh, there is hope in the air that the war on virus versus vaccines is about to be won. A subject, of course, uh, to good behavior, to good social behavior. <laughs> you know, we can't uh, uh, underestimate the challenges that we have and the preparedness that we need to have. I wish you and your beloved uh, uh, family members a uh, uh, very happy Deepavali with uh, happy days ahead, uh, full of happiness, most importantly, uh, full of good health, uh, prosperity, and above all, peace, both internally and in the external world. Thank you very much. I ha hand it back, uh, uh, General Patankar, to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mashelkar, for uh, that very warm welcome uh, on behalf of all, our, all of us, that is PIC, PPF, the Tribune Trust, and CAS. Um, as mentioned already by the President, that uh, we're very fortunate, in fact, because uh, consider ourselves very fortunate, uh, as Sri Ajit Dobal, the National Security Advisor, Government of India has very kindly addressed, uh, agreed to address uh, um, us during uh, this session and uh, give the inaugural address. Before I hand over the floor to Shri Doval, allow me to say a few words about him. Um, he, he is uh, one person who is, uh, uh, who keeps his privacy very close to his heart, and therefore, um, I'll keep it brief. Ladies and gentlemen, Sri Doval is the fifth and the current National Security Advisor. Some of these small details we don't know, so I thought I'll make a mention. He is a distinguished former Indian Police Service Officer, an IPS officer, uh, of the Kerala cadre. He also is a former intelligence officer, a field in which he really excelled. And um, that's one field which is less talked about. So probably uh, his, his achievements in that field are not spoken of. Many of us are not aware, and I want to make a mention of it specifically, that he is the recipient, and not just the recipient, but the youngest police officer to be uh, recognized with the award of Kirti Chakra. Now, Kirti Chakra is an award normally awarded to military personnel for conspicuous bravery. So this is a, a very distinct achievement of Sri Ajit Dover. And we're, like I said, very fortunate to have him give us the inaugural address. The floor is yours, uh, Sri Dover. Dr. Mashelkar, President Pune International Center, Dr. Vijay Kelkar, Vice President Shri Haldar, President Policy Perspective Foundation, Shri Kem Singh, Vice President PPF, General Patankar, convener of this event, esteemed ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I heartily compliment the Pune International Center Policy Perspective Foundation, the Tribune Trust for organizing the sixth annual Pune Dialogue on a very topical theme of national security preparedness in the age of disasters and pandemics. I feel privileged to speak to this August gathering and I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Friends, most of you associated with the organizations conducting this event have been eminent practitioners in the fields of national security, diplomacy, and strategic studies. You are all well aware of the transformative changes that are taking place in the global security landscape. 
wars are increasingly becoming cost ineffective instruments of achieving nations political and military objectives they are being substituted by what contemporary strategists describe as war by other means probably today it is needs to be expanded to include threats through other sources well friends the new areas of warfare have shifted from merely territorial frontiers to the civil society the common people their thinking their perceptions their health their sense of well-being the perception of their own governments have assumed new importance this also includes their physical well-being and sense of physical safety and security cumulatively all these elements impact on the will of the nation which is a vital force of a nation's strength when the civil society gets degraded their faith in the governments and its institutions get eroded then there is always an internal turmoil the security doctrines of fourth generation warfare are also people centric rather than territory centric the new form of warfare estimates that targeting the civil society and the people is a low cost and sustainable option to bleed the adversary the covid pandemic and devastating natural disasters have the potential to impact on collective psyche of the people their economic well-being and instill fears about their survival it generates social imbalances that can threaten political stability economic growth and even the capacity of a nation to resolutely meet its external and internal threats these new genre of security threats present the states with a multi layered dilemma on a massive scale at the micro level saving individual lives providing medical care and support to people ensuring supplies of food and essential commodities maintaining law and order are just few amongst many at the macro level the problems include finding effective preventive and curative medicines and administering these to combat the ever evolving new strains of viruses and ensuring smooth supply chains a key challenge is working out strategies for growth in this environment that are sustainable and avoids environmental degradation protecting people from false and motivated propaganda also becomes absolutely necessary in this age of information revolution national security planning needs to factor in all these challenges as a so strategies to get maximum international cooperation covid-19 has brought science data and economic security to the center of national security planning in fact many path breaking solutions have emerged from this city of pune itself the national institute of virology the serum institute of india indian institute of science education and research and the center for development of advanced computing have all contributed to meeting the challenges generated by the pandemic decisions about maintaining strategic national stockpiles ensuring the availability and smooth supply of critical equipment and materials and fortifying early alert frameworks have all become important elements of national security planning the pandemic has further it reinforced the need to predict threats while biological research has legitimate scientific purposes it dual use applications can be misused the deliberate weaponization of dangerous pathogens is a serious concern 
This has heightened the need to build comprehensive national capabilities in biodefense, biosafety, and biosecurity. Climate change is another threat multiplier with unpredictable consequences. It impacts the availability of resources, which are increasingly become scarce and could become source of conflict and competition. Climate change can accelerate instability and cause massive population, population displacements. By 2030, 600 million people in India are expected to live in the urban areas. Migrations from low-lying coastal areas in South Asia due to climatic change can add to the already stressed urban infrastructure. All these will present problems of internal security management, economic security, water and food security, just to name a few. In such an evolving national security environment, there is a need to reinvent and innovate ourselves. Rapid developments are taking place in fourth industrial revolution technologies like artificial intelligence, autonomous and unmanned systems and digital, digital infrastructure. Social media and disinformation is adding to the complexity of national security management. A fuller integration of science and technology in all aspects of development and security has therefore become essential. Advances in science and technology will help prevent hazards from becoming disastrous. The advanced technologies like prediction technologies and risk communication techniques are being applied to every facet of disaster risk reduction. Disaster and pandemics are borderless threats which cannot be combated in isolation. Today, the world of high connectivity and global opportunity also makes it a world of high vulnerability. We have to evolve strategies to maximize our gains and minimize our losses. Global and regional coordination is a key factor for which India has initiated several steps in forums like BIMSTEC, Indian Ocean Rim Association, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and Quad. Seamless exchange of information and intelligence, sharing of experience and lessons learned, technology transfer and coordination are important for disaster management and mitigation. Well, friends, climate change, environmental degradation, and pollution are realities that threaten our very survival. Businesses and security apparatuses need to focus on disaster-resilient infrastructure and preserving natural resources for our future generations. An important climate change summit is coming up in Glasgow in early November. India is committed to meet its climatic goals and has already undertaken several path-breaking measures. Harmony with nature has been a cornerstone of Indian civilization. Preservation of environment while pursuing its ambitious economic goals is the guiding doctrine of the present government's developmental policies. With a population of 1,300 million, India's per capita greenhouse gas emission is 2.47 tons of carbon dioxide, as compared to the global average of 6.45 tons of carbon dioxide. This is 60% lower than the global average. We have already met nearly 50% of our commitment to achieve 450 gigawatt 
of renewable energy capacity by 2030. In addition, we have undertaken a series of measures to decarbonize India's economy. These targets have been widely applauded at global level. At the same time, while India is taking all these steps, it is important for the world to understand that given our size, population, and unique developmental requirements, our commitments cannot be compared with those of the Western world. The most enduring message of COVID-19 pandemic and climate change is that only the well-being of all will ensure the survival of all. Those who have greater resources should expand their embrace so that it touches the lives of maximum people. I would like to conclude by wishing the sixth Pune Dialogue on national security all the success. I am confident that concrete policy options will emerge at the end of these deliberations. This will provide valuable inputs to policymakers in meeting the challenges posed by disasters and pandemics. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you very much, uh, Shri Dovalji, for, um, in fact, introducing us to the vast panorama of emerging threats, existing threats, and contextualizing the national security preparedness or the need for greater national security preparedness in the age of disasters and pandemics. Because now we have seen the, the whole spectrum of areas in which we need to contextualize these two uh, calamities. Both are catastrophes, if I might say, not just calamities. And uh, we are very thankful you've um, put us on the right track for the, the, the rest of the sessions, which will take a cue from what you've just mentioned. Thanks once again for sparing your time. You, you are, and uh, yet, uh, you, you found time to speak to us. We are very grateful. I next have another well-known, I might say world, world um, famous personality to give us the keynote address. And that is Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who is the chief scientific advisor to the World Health Organization. She was appointed uh, World Health Organization's first chief secretary, as uh, chief scientist, I beg your pardon, in March 2019. A pediatrician from India and a globally recognized researcher on tuberculosis and HIV, she brings with her 30 years of experience in clinical care and research and has worked throughout her career to translate research into impactful programs. Dr. Swaminathan was the secretary to the government of India for health, research, and director general of the Indian Council of Medical Research from 2015 to 2017. In that position, she focused on bringing science and evidence, both, um, both, both uh, things are important, but science and evidence, not theoretical science, into health policy making, building research capacity in Indian medical schools and forging South-South partnership in health science. Some of those impact of some of those policies, we are able to now see and uh, reap the benefits from. From 2009 to 2011, she also served as coordinator for the UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, and World Health Organization Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases in Geneva. She received her uh, academic training in India 
the United Kingdom, and the United States of America. And she has published more than 350 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. She is an elected foreign fellow of the US National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of all three science academies in India. The science division's role is to ensure that World Health Organization stays ahead of the curve and leverages advances in science and technology for public health and clinical care, as well as ensuring that the norms, standards, and guidelines produced by WHO are scientifically excellent, relevant, and timely. Her vision, and this is important, her vision is to ensure that the World Health Organization is at the cutting edge of science and is able to translate new knowledge into meaningful impact on population health, population health worldwide. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Swaminathan give us the keynote address. Dr. Swaminathan, the floor is yours. Respected Sri Ajit Dobalji, General Patankar, Dr. Mashelkar, esteemed dignitaries, colleagues, friends, thank you for inviting me to say a few words at the opening of the Pune Dialogue on National Security, which I think is taking place at a really important moment. Of course, I'm coming from the standpoint of health security, also being one of the national security threats we face. And as we've seen during the pandemic, a health security threat can be as bad as any other kind of a security threat um, for the country, but also for the world. Two years almost into the pandemic now, and we're a prospect of over 5 million documented and notified deaths. Clearly, the true death rate is much higher globally and in every country. And again, as a reflection, one and a half million children have been left orphaned due to the loss of a caregiver. This is going to impact their whole lives. Lots of families have been impacted by deaths, by people having been affected by the disease, some of them having long COVID. And also it's caused huge economic disruptions and disruptions to global trade. Everybody, everywhere, has suffered in one way or the other. So this is at a time when actually, if you look back several years, there have been many predictions and many reports that have predicted that a pandemic, particularly through a respiratory pathogen, a respiratory virus could arise. We knew that most likely it's a zoonotic uh, virus that would come from probably a wild animal or bird, perhaps through a domestic, domesticated animal to humans or directly. And everything that we're doing today in the world in terms of not living in harmony with our environment, deforestation, urbanization, the animal-human conflicts, the illegal trade in wildlife, the wet markets in some countries, all of these actually increase the possibility of these viruses jumping from one species to the other. So I think we have to now be convinced that the next epidemic or the next pandemic is not an if but a when, and it could be waiting to happen at any time. Before this pandemic, I think scientists expected that influenza was the most likely virus to cause the next pandemic, but we have been surprised with the coronavirus. And we know that there are plenty of other coronaviruses out there in nature. And of course, influenza viruses, which also undergo recombination and they can then uh, jump between species and become pathogenic to humans. So this is really a critical moment for us to think at the national level, but also at the global level as to what steps we need to take in order to prevent a future pandemic, to try to catch it at the earliest possible time, 
and prevent it from becoming a larger outbreak, to be able to respond to it effectively and to be then able to recover from it uh, if it does happen. This is going to require um, lots of actions, lots of efforts at many different levels and at least from the WHO side we have had several major committees looking at the different regulations. We've had the independent panel, very high level panel on pandemic preparedness and response. We've had the review committee for the international health regulations and we've had the global preparedness monitoring board which has just come up with their third report which is entitled from worlds apart to a world prepared. Their first report that came out just three months before the pandemic hit was actually if you look back now highly predictive it, it was talking about a world at risk and it talked about the risk of a pandemic. The second report last year when we were in the height of the pandemic uh, was a world in disorder and their third report today is looking ahead to see what actions can be taken to be better prepared. I think at the global level clearly we need action on governance on strengthening WHO so that WHO has the capacity and the infrastructure and resources to be able to monitor, to be able to go to countries and inspect, to be able to do early advance warnings. All of that needs to happen through uh, increased predictable funding for WHO, which of course will come with its own accountability framework. And it needs a very high level political commitment, which hopefully in the coming days we will see at the G20 finance and health ministers meeting followed by the G20 heads of state meeting as to what kinds of commitment the political leaders are going to make in order to work together um, to address this because pandemics just like climate change cannot be addressed a country at a time. They need a, a, a global uh, agreement on governance, on financing. You need an independent financing mechanism so that as soon as there is a uh, a pandemic, the, the financing can immediately come into play. And then you need a series of systems and tools. We saw this time that um, there were issues with supply chains, with the production of uh, basic necessities like masks, gloves, oxygen, drugs, vaccines, diagnostics. And there were many other issues also of risk communication and of countries taking public health actions which were coordinated and which were based on science and evidence. So these things need to happen at the global level. We, they will need to talk about governance, about financing, and about the systems and tools that need to be done. You also need regional level preparedness, and there are regional bodies that are also now discussing things like local production of health products so that you have regional health security. And then you have the national response and the national plans, which again, we could look at from the leadership and governance point of view, where we have mechanisms at the national level, which at the time of a threat, bring together all of the different arms of government, private sector and civil society, so that it really becomes an all of government and all of society response. It needs to be obviously directed and coordinated by a group uh, at the center. And since in a federal structure, we have to work across multiple state governments, it's really important to have one coordinating group. Policies, norms and guidance need to be developed in advance so that every uh, sector, every uh, government department, private sector, civil society are all aware of what will need to be done when such a threat uh, arises. So all partners need to be engaged. Very important is community engagement and we need mechanisms for community engagement that need to be built right from the beginning so that they can also be activated during an emergency. You need some legal and regulatory frameworks. The, the responses have to be rapid. They have to balance benefits and risks of different approaches. And uh, this needs to be pre thought out and some kind of uh, guidance uh, uh, developed. And then of course, every country needs to also play its role at the global level in discussing and defining what a pandemic preparedness treaty or agreement uh, would look like. In terms of systems and tools at the national level, obviously early warning and surveillance is going to be very critically important. So we need networks of laboratories 
that are connected, that are at different levels, doing different types of testing, but we need to invest in diagnostic capacity at the primary healthcare level. This is good for universal health coverage and it's good for health security. Today, we do not globally prioritize diagnostics, but it's become very clear now why this is important, not just for infectious diseases, but also for non-communicable diseases. We know a third of Indians and adults globally have hypertension, but if you don't have the blood pressure monitoring device in the primary health center, there is no way an individual can be diagnosed. So from simple things like BP monitors, blood sugar strips, ECG, to more complex uh, blood testing assays, which could be done at the district hospital level, these need to be actually put in place. And we have a lot of innovation in this space now with platform technologies that can test for multiple pathogens from dengue to malaria, to HPV, to influenza, and to COVID-19. Investments in universal health coverage and building core capacity at the primary healthcare level is going to be critically important because that's where the data, that's where the first signals are going to come from. And, and you know, all nurses and doctors really need to be trained in being able to report any unusual cluster of uh, cases that they may be seeing. So capacity building, periodic mentoring and assessment is going to be important. One Health, we have to monitor animals and humans. That data has to be shared. This again does not happen either at the global or national level currently. Systems will need to be developed. Platforms have to be built. Genome sequencing is a good example of something which has really come to the fore. We have something like over 4 million whole genome sequences today of COVID being shared uh, in global platforms. So that capacity nationally now has been established. It should extend to other pathogens and it should be a constant monitoring of environment, animal and human um, pathogens so that one gets a comprehensive look all the time and you can then make some predictions, modeling, use artificial intelligence, etc. to see in what direction this may be going. The workforce is very important, training of the workforce is very important. Then uh, we need to look at R&D and clearly this took everyone by surprise and it took time for countries to put together teams uh, and coordinate research and development in a focused manner. So what I mean is that you need the private sector to develop drugs and diagnostics and vaccines, but it needs the government to provide the stewardship, provide financing, and also enable procurement and equitable distribution. And I think equitable access is something that has to be paid attention at the national level and the global level in every country, there are vulnerable groups that tend to get left out uh, when it comes to uh, uh, healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare as well as the distribution of health uh, products. Procurement, supply chain, stockpiles, all of that needs to be considered. These platform technologies like mRNA and adenoviral vector platforms provide an opportunity for us to really make vaccines very rapidly today. So establishing those centers which have capacity in these platform technologies and which can rapidly ramp up. So manufacturing capacity which could be used during regular times for other vaccines and health products, but during an epidemic or a pandemic can quickly turn to making these vaccines. Not just vaccines, but also we've seen the role of monoclonal antibodies and biologics for which there is very little capacity today. Uh, and many parts of the world do not have access to monoclonal antibodies. Again, these antibodies are used not only to treat COVID and other infectious diseases, but can also be, are being used to treat cancer and other NCDs. So again, an important um, area for us to invest in for the future. And of course, then you need financing, you need financing for all of these things that I've mentioned, for setting up surveillance systems, for setting up digital platforms, for really building capacity of the workforce and having in every district an epidemiologist and a team who is constantly monitoring the risks to public health. This is all going to pay off in the long run because it's not that these people will work only for future pandemics. They will be constantly working for public health and to improve uh, the health of the population in general. And then having a good communication mechanisms, uh, training also media, media colleagues on how to report on, uh, on health issues, 
how to build health literacy in the in the population starting from school children but all the way up health literacy science literacy belief in um, these tools which science is developing and how to use them well uh, an integration of different systems of medicine but with a clear focus on evidence generation evidence synthesis and again that also requires systematic investments in being able to not only do the research and the clinical trials but then pool all of that evidence and data be able to synthesize it and then that should feed really into the recommendations whether it's treatment recommendations or prevention and finally i would say that we need behavioral social scientists we need economists sociologists ethicists legal representatives to be on uh, these kind of governance committees because when it comes to a pandemic or when it comes to this kind of a threat to the population as a whole we know that it impacts all aspects of life and an intervention in one area may have unintended consequences on another area and therefore we need these multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary teams to sit and think about um about the proposed interventions and to see whether they uh, actually make sense or they need some kind of a, a modification so i think a lot of very interesting lessons um have been learned but i do hope that it doesn't go to waste that it's not forgotten that we don't go into these regular cycles of panic and neglect which the world has been doing and that we focus on investments in health and look at it as an investment and not as an expenditure because we've seen that without health we don't have anything else left in our lives and this is a time when we are building back to build back better to build back greener to invest in health particularly of young people but also to keep in mind always equity and ethics in everything that we are doing this is very very important and uh, to focus on those who are the most vulnerable who may not have a voice otherwise as we look ahead we also have a lot of catching up to do to get to the sdg targets we are falling way behind because of the pandemic and therefore all of these investments will also help us in achieving all of the other health related sdgs thank you very much for this opportunity namaskar thank you very much uh, dr swaminathan for that comprehensive coverage and a, a, a keynote address in its true sense uh, for all of us two things uh, i wish to point out um, as i said as the navigator where i pick up certain landmarks along the way and um, what i did pick up apart from the uh, huge amount of advice and uh, direction that she gave um uh, and what i'm about to say is not merely jugglery of semantics but the pointers that she alluded to towards it was not just for uh, improvement of better healthcare in our country or worldwide but also preparedness in general and to me it meant a much wider advantage and that wider advantage is if if we go along and take cognizance of those pointers it will contribute to better preparedness and better preparedness in turn contributes to national security so i found that uh, apart from uh, looking at the the clinical and the health aspects in the content of her of her address i found there were a lot of things that we as uh, the interested party in the national security preparedness could also get a lot of benefit in the larger context next i wish to uh, invite a marshal bhushan gokhale to give the uh, a word of thanks but before he does so i must point out a few things about uh, a marshal gokhale pdns today is because of him what it is is because of him he was the pioneer he set up pdns and ran it for 3 years if i'm not mistaken was it four 
So he is the one who laid the foundation of this flagship event of Pune International Center. And today it has come of age because the foundation was so strong. Over to you, Air Marshal Bingo Gokhale. Thank you, Chandra Patrinka. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege for me to propose a word of thanks for the inaugural session of the sixth Pune Dialogue on National Security, or PDNS as it's known as. We have just heard two very insightful talks by the National Security Advisor, Sri Ajit Dogal, Kriti Chakra, and Dr. Swaminathan, Chief Scientist at World Health Organization. These speeches have given a very outstanding start to the proceedings which will follow in this period in 2021, is highlighting the theme, the national security preparedness in the age of disasters and pandemics. And as rightly pointed out by Dr. Marshalkar in his inaugural, he mentioned, emphasize on the word age, that it is not just a one-off event, but we have to be prepared in future also for such disasters and pandemics. As a member of the core group of PDNS, guided by Dr. Marshalkar and Dr. Vijay Kerkar, we have deliberated on issues of the past two years. On one hand, the COVID-19, which has affected the whole world. And on the other hand, the rapid environmental degradation, which are causing number of disasters worldwide. And therefore it is important that we had today, the NSA highlighting some of the issues on these, both the important aspects. He pointed out that there are transformative changes taking place in the global security landscape. War has moved from territorial frontiers to civil society and the response of government during such pandemics and disasters has a lasting impression on the citizens of the country and their perceptions of government response during difficult times. He mentioned that will of the people can get degraded and that is what the adversary would look at as a low cost option. Noting that pandemics and disasters have potential to affect the, affect the collective psyche of people leading to social instability, political imbalance, and therefore the importance of national security. The NSA also mentioned importance of science, data, economic security at the center of national security planning. Sri Ajit Dhoval also mentioned that national stockpiles of critical equipment and smooth supply of various resources, resilience, these need to be factored in during planning. He stressed on the need to reinvent and innovate ourselves to counter bio threats arising from dual use applications of advanced sciences. He highlighted that social media and misinformation as well as digital revolution are adding to the complexities of national security management. Regarding the forthcoming summit at Glasgow in November, COP as is known as, he noted that India has been advancing very well towards achieving various targets in mitigating climate change. And I must say that with various security challenges being faced by the country, it is under the astute leadership and advice of Sri Ajit Doval that the India is resiliently facing these challenges and ensuring security at all levels. I thank you, sir, for having given us this outstanding speech. I also want to focus on what Dr. Swaminathan mentioned in her keynote address. She also mentioned that the health security has become very important as part of the entire national security apparatus. She mentioned some of the figures, like 1.5 million children have been orphaned. There is economic deprivation. There is social disruption adding to issues of internal security. One of the reasons is not living in harmony with nature. And therefore, she also mentioned that we should prevent, respond, and recover. Regarding the WHO and the role of it, she mentioned that there are seven committees being formed to look at various aspects, and there is a need to strengthen WHO for better governance. We talked about the G20 summit, which is taking place and various commitments that could be made for strengthening WHO. 
She also looked at supply chain of Mars gloves, oxygen, and the related finances, which are important. And therefore, she spoke about the regional as well as national plan for governance and response to pandemics. She spoke about training the health workers for early science, modeling the research and development, and the role of private sector and the government officials. She also spoke about role of media in this multidisciplinary approach for national security. Our own Dr. Mashelkar, of course, as I mentioned, spoke in the beginning and talked about the speed, scale, and livelihood. He also spoke about the similarities between pandemics and climate change and the requirement for disaster prevention and mitigation. I think all three of them have put us on a very right track for the proceedings to come. I must also thank the four constituents who form PDNS, Mr. K.M. Singh and Mr. P.C. Haldar from the PPF, General Mehta from the Tribune Foundation, General Patanka, who's coordinating this very rightly and also is navigating it. And of course, Ambassador Mangal Murthy and myself from Center for Advanced Strategic Studies. We thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this large number and wish you a continued deliberations in the forthcoming sessions. Thank you, Jai Hind. Thank you. Uh, that, that surely called for a hand clap, frankly. Um, that brings us to the end of uh, the inaugural session, ladies and gentlemen. The next session would commence at 12 o'clock, 12 noon. Uh, I will be available uh, for you to, to interact uh, by, uh, by about uh, 11.50, 1150 hours, uh, in case you have any difficulty to resume the, the session. And we have a very interesting uh, session coming up, which is devoted to disaster risk reduction, and uh, which is considered as a part or is taken as a part of national security preparedness. So we're looking for some uh, exciting discussion, a presentation and discussion, I would say, and uh, look forward to it. Thank you very much for your forbearance and attendance, and uh, see you again in about half an hour's time. Jai Hind.